The Christmas Goblins by Charles Dickens Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghosts, Ghouls and Spooky Things This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nislihan Stamboli The Christmas Goblins In an old abbey town, a long, long while ago, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard one Gabriel Grubb. He was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket. A little before twilight one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself toward the old churchyard, for he had a grave to finish by next morning. And feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. He strode along, until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard, a nice, gloomy, mournful place into which the townspeople did not care to go except in broad daylight. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a merry Christmas. Gabriel waited until the boy came up, then wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times, to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away, with his hand to his head, Gabriel Grubb chuckled to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, put down his lantern, and getting into an unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so with right good will. But the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. At any other time, this would have made Gabriel very miserable, but he was so pleased at having stopped the small boy singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made when he had finished work for the night, and looked down into the grave with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one! Brave lodgings for one! A few feet of cold earth when life is done! <laughs> he laughed as he set himself down on a flat tombstone which was a favourite resting place of his and drew forth his wicker bottle a coffin at Christmas a Christmas box <laughs> <laughs> repeated a voice close beside him it was the echoes said he raising the bottle to his lips again it was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him was a strange, unearthly figure. He was sitting perfectly still, grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. "'What do you hear on Christmas Eve?' said the goblin sternly. "'I, uh, I came to dig a grave, sir,' stammered Gabriel. "'What man wanders among graves on such a night as this?' cried the goblin. "'Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb!' screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Uh, Holland, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he had bought it of the smugglers, and he thought his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who brings Hollands alone and in a churchyard on such a night as this? Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb exclaimed the wild voices again. And who then is our lawful prize? exclaimed the goblin, raising his voice. 
the invisible chorus replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? said the goblin as he grinned a broader grin than before. The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? It's, um, it's very curious, sir, uh, very curious, sir, and uh, very pretty, replied the sexton, half dead with fright. Uh, but I think I'll go back and uh, finish my work, sir, uh, if you please. Work? said the goblin. What work? The grave, sir. Oh, the grave, eh? Who makes graves at a time when other men are merry and takes a pleasure in it? Again the voices replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. I'm afraid, my friends, won't you, Gabriel? said the goblin. Uh, under favour, sir, replied the horror-stricken sexton. Uh, uh, I don't think they can. Uh, they don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me. Oh, yes, they have. We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry and he could not. Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh, which the echoes returned twentyfold. I, uh, I'm afraid I must leave you, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us, said the goblin. <laughs> As the goblin laughed, he suddenly darted toward Gabriel, laid his hand upon his collar, and sank with him through the earth. And when he had had time to fetch his breath, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by goblins, ugly and grim. And now, said the king of the goblins, seated in the centre of the room on an elevated seat, his friend of the churchyard, show the man of misery and gloom. A few of the pictures from our great storehouses. As the goblin said this, a clown rolled gradually away and disclosed a small and scantily furnished but neat apartment. Little children were gathered round the bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown or gambling round her chair. A frugal meal was spread upon the table and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. Soon the father entered, and the children ran to meet him. As he sat down to his meal, the mother sat by his side, and all seemed happiness and comfort. What do you think of that? said the goblin. Gabriel murmured something about its being very pretty. Show him some more, said the goblin. Many a time the cloud went and came, and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb. He saw that men who worked hard and earned their scanty bread were cheerful and happy, and he came to the conclusion it was a very respectable sort of a world after all. No sooner had he formed it than the cloud closed over the last picture, seemed to settle on his senses and lull him to repose. One by one, the goblins faded from his sight, and as the last one disappeared, he sank to sleep. The day had broken when he awoke and found himself lying on the flat gravestone with the wicker bottle empty by his side. He got on his feet as well as he could, and brushing the frost off his coat, turned his face toward the town. But he was an altered man. He had learned lessons of gentleness and good nature by his strange adventures in the goblins' cavern. End of The Christmas Goblins Recording by Neslihan Stamboli Dead Before Death by Christina G. Rossetti Coffee Break Collection 24 
ghosts, ghouls, and spooky things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Liverpool. Dead before death. Sonnet. Ah, changed and cold. How changed and very cold. With stiffened, smiling lips and cold, calm eyes. Changed, yet the same. Much knowing, little wise. This was the promise of the days of old, Grown hard and stubborn in the ancient mould, Grown rigid in the sham of life-long lies. We hoped for better things as years would rise, But it is over as a tale once told, All fallen, the blossom that no fruitage bore, All lost, the present and the future time, All lost, all lost, the lapse that went before, so lost till death shut to the open door, so lost from chime to everlasting chime, so cold and lost for ever, evermore. End of Dead Before Death Death by Rainer Maria Milka Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghosts, Gulls, and Spooky Things This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Liverpool. Death. Before us great death stands, our fate held close within his quiet hands. When with proud joy we lift life's red wine, do drink deep of the mystic shining cup, and ecstasy through all our being leaps, death bows his head and weeps. End of death. Exposes the Tricks of Spirit Mediums by Anonymous from the New York Times, November 13, 1911. Coffee Break Collection 24. Ghosts, Ghouls, and Spooky Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Exposes the Tricks of Spirit Mediums. Joseph F. Wren shows how they can dupe a gathering and communicate with spooks. A man and woman protest. Announce that they are mediums. The woman gets offers of $3,000 to disprove fraud. Joseph F. Wren, president of the Brooklyn Philosophical Association, spoke yesterday afternoon at the Long Island Business College, South 8th Street, Brooklyn, on spiritualism. He produced mediumistic phenomena using the lingo of the profession, and then exposing the trickery. The meeting was a turbulent one because of the presence in the hall of believers in spiritualism. One man brought his own slates and paper, and a woman, who said she had been a medium for 35 years, stood up and denounced the affair, calling it a performance, and demanding to know whether Mr. Wren had a theatrical license for a Sunday performance. Before the meeting closed, she had received offers amounting to $3,000 if she would produce phenomena with no chance of fraud. She refused. Mr. Wren was one of those who investigated Euspacia Palladino, and he showed how the Italian woman did some of her tricks. In one case, he showed how a medium in a dark room, bound and blindfolded, could tell what the investigators had written and put in sealed envelopes, how to read a selected line in a book, and give demonstrations in noise-making and handing out spirit touches. In his opening address, Mr. Wren criticized the psychical research investigators, especially Professor Hislop. He said they were well-meaning, but not able to consider evidence. As a demonstration of telepathy, four men were called to the platform. A book was handed to them, and each was requested to write on the fly-leaf two sets of figures. The book was then handed to a fourth man, and he added the figures. Then Mr. Wren, from another side of the platform, promptly called out the result. He then explained how it was done. In handing the book to the fourth man and getting off a side line of gesture, he had turned it over, so that the figures added up by the fourth man were really the figures he had written there earlier in the evening on the last leaf of the book. Slips were passed about the audience, and questions written on them. They were folded by the writers and passed to the platform. While this was going on, Mr. Wren spoke of the difficulty in calling up spirits and gave the usual talk of a medium on such an occasion. He continued this while taking up the slips, 
placing each on his forehead and apparently answering the question. What he did do, he told his audience, was to keep one question ahead so that while apparently reading one question out loud, he was really reading the question to be answered next. It was at this point that a man insisted on turning in a question written on his own paper and sealed in an envelope he had brought. There was a protest against this, but Mr. Wren said he would make the test. The man was asked to write the name of some man well known in history and seal it up. Mr. Wren went down into the audience, took the envelope, and returned to the platform, holding it in both hands. He placed it on the stand, and after a few minutes' talk, said the name written was that of Abraham Lincoln. It was, and the audience cheered. Mr. Wren then said that while walking to the platform he had rubbed alcohol on the envelope and made it transparent. His talk, he said, was to give the spirits time to evaporate. Then followed slate-writing tricks. A magnet moved under a slate made a bit of pencil write no. He slipped his foot out of his shoe when another man thought he was holding both feet, and demonstrated how to write on a slate under a table holding a pencil with his toes. The same man wanted to know if Mr. Wren could write a message on a slate tied up in paper. Mr. Wren said he could, and the man said he had brought his own slate. He mounted the platform, bringing with him two slates wrapped up in yellow paper. The demonstrator put the man in a chair and made passes over his head with the slates. While he talked of controls, a confederate slipped up behind a screen and cleverly exchanged the slates as Wren waved them above the man's head. Then the Confederate slipped back of the screen and wrote the message, tied up the slates again, and again exchanged them. It was in the interval before the second part of the program that the indignant woman medium got up to protest. She was allowed to take the platform. She said the tricks did nothing to disprove the truth of spiritualism, and that she had communication with spirits. Her remarks were greeted with some applause, but the majority in the audience jeered at her. She refused to give her name. You go to Professor Hislop's secretary if you want my name, she said. She knows who I am. The final demonstration took nearly an hour. The scene was supposed to be in a dark room, where a spiritualist was demonstrating psychic power to a committee of investigators. As the room could not be darkened, the five investigators and the medium were blindfolded. Before this was done, the committee agreed upon a line in a certain page of a book wrote and sealed their questions, and securely bound Mr. Wren in a chair. As soon as the eyes of the investigators were bandaged, Mr. Wren skillfully slipped out of his bonds, took off the bandage from his eyes, and proceeded to pound a desk, knock on the floor, and stamp about. Before the trick began, he had been carefully searched, yet he drew from his clothing a black bag and other paraphernalia necessary to do the trick. It was all simple when viewed from the audience. He picked up a chair and touched it to the laps of the members of the committee. Then he took off his shoes, and complaining the spirits were lifting him up, he touched them with the soles on the knees, shoulders, and head as though he were walking over them. He took the book and the sealed envelopes, pulled over his head the black bag, and read them by the light of an electric flashlight. It took skill to retie himself in the chair again, but he did it. End of Exposes the Tricks of Spirit Mediums Recording by Colleen McMahon The Fascination of the Ghost Story by Arthur B. Reed Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghosts, Ghouls, and Spooky Things This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE FASCINATION OF THE GHOST STORY What is the fascination we feel for the mystery of the ghost story? Is it of the same nature as the fascination which we feel for the mystery of the detective story? Of the latter fascination, the late Paul Armstrong used to say that it was because we are all as full of crime as Sing Sing, only we don't dare. Thus, may I ask, are we not fascinated by the ghost story because no matter what may be the scientific or sceptical bent of our minds, in our inmost souls, secretly perhaps, we are as full of superstition as an obia man, only we don't let it loose. Who shall say that he is able to fling off lightly the inheritance of countless ages of superstition, 
is there not a streak of superstition in all of us we laughed at the voodoo worshipper then create our own hoodoos our pet obsessions it has been said that man is incurably religious that if all religions were blotted out man would create a new religion man is incurably fascinated by the mysterious if all the ghost stories of the ages were blotted out man would invent new ones for do we not all stand in awe of that which we cannot explain of that which if it not be in our own experience is certainly recorded in the experience of others of that of which we know and can know nothing sceptical though one may be of the occult he must needs be interested in things that others believe to be objective that certainly are subjectively very real to them the ghost story is not born of science nor even of super science whatever that may be it is not of science at all it is of another sphere despite all that the psychic researchers have tried to demonstrate there are in life two sorts of people who for want of a better classification i may call the psychic and the non-psychic if i ask the psychic to close his eyes and i say to him horse he immediately visualizes a horse the other non-psychic does not i rather incline to believe that it is the former class who see ghosts or rather some of them the latter do not though they share interest in them the artists are of the visualizing class and in our more modern times it is the psychic who think in motion pictures or at least in a succession of still pictures however we explain the ghostly and supernatural whether we give it objective or merely subjective reality neither explanation prevents the non-psychic from being intensely interested in the visions of the psychic thus i am convinced that if we were all quite honest with ourselves whether we believe in or do not believe in ghosts at least we are all deeply interested in them there is in this interest something that makes all the world akin who does not feel a suppressed start at the creaking of furniture in the dark night who has not felt a shiver of goose flesh controlled only by an effort of will who in the dark has not had the feeling of some thing behind him and in spite of his conscious reasoning turn to look if there be any man who has not it may be that to him ghost stories have no fascination let him at least however be honest to every human being mystery appeals be it that of the crime cases on which a large part of yellow journalism is founded or be it in the cases of dupin of lecoq of sherlock holmes of arsene lupin of craig kennedy or a host of our other fiction mystery characters the appeal is the mystery the detective's case is solved at the end however but even in the case of a ghost story the underlying mystery remains in the ghost story we have the very quintessence of mystery authors publishers editors dramatists writers of motion pictures tell us that never before has there been such an intense and wide interest in mystery stories as there is today that in itself explains the interest in the super mystery story of the ghost and ghostly doings another element of mystery lies in such stories deeper and further back is the supreme mystery of life after death what impossible scorns the non-psychic as he listens to some ghost story to which doggedly replies the mind of the opposite type not so i believe because it is impossible the uncanny the unhealthy as in the master of such writing poe fascinates whether we will or no the imp of the perverse lures us on that is why we read with enthralled interest these excursions into the eerie unknown perhaps reading on till the mystic hour of midnight increases the creepy pleasure one might write a volume of analysis and appreciation of this aptly balanced anthology of ghost stories assembled here after years of reading and study by mr j l french foremost among the impressions that a casual reader will derive is the interesting fact just as in detective mystery stories so in ghost stories styles change each age each period has the ghost story peculiar to itself 
today there is a new style of ghost story gradually evolving once stories were of fairies fays trolls the little people of poltergeist and luke garou through various ages we have progressed to the ghost story of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries until today in the twentieth we are seeing a modern style which the new science is modifying materially high among the stories in this volume one must recognize the masterful art of algernon blackwood's the woman's ghost story i was interested in psychic things says the woman as she starts to tell her story simply with a sweep toward a climax that has the ring of the truth of fiction here perhaps we have the modern style of ghost story at its best times change as well as styles the man who went too far is of intense interest as an attempt to bring into our own times an interpretation of the symbolism underlying greek mythology applied to england of some years ago to see pan meant death hence in the story there is a philosophy of pantheism no me no you no it it is a mystical story with a storm scene in which is painted a picture that reminds one strongly of the fall of the house of usher with the frankly added words on him were marks of hoofs of a monstrous goat that had leaped on him uncompromising mysticism happy is the kipling section the phantom rickshaw if only that obiter dictum of ghost presence as kipling explains about the rift in the brain and a little bit of the dark world came through and pressed him to death then there are the racial styles of ghost stories the volume takes us from the banshees and other death warnings of ireland to a strange example of jewish mysticism in the silent woman mr french has been very wide in his choice giving us these as well as many examples from the literature of england and france finally as compiled from the newspapers as typically american many ghost stories of new york and other parts of the country strange that one should find humor in a subject so weird yet we find it take for instance defoe's old narrative the apparition of mrs veal it is a hoax nothing more of our own times is ellis parker butler's day ain't no ghost showing an example of the modern negro's racial heritage in our literature and on the stage the very idea of a darkie in a graveyard is mirth-provoking mr butler extracts some pithy philosophy from his darky boy i ain't scared of ghosts what am cause they ain't no ghosts but i just feel kind of uneasy about the ghosts what ain't humor is succeeded by pathos in the interval we find a sympathetic twist to the ghost story an actual desire to meet the dead it is not however to be compared for interest to the story of sheer terror as in bulwer lighton's the haunted and the haunters with the flight of the servant in terror the cowering of the dog against the wall the death of the dog its neck actually broken by the terror and all that go to make an experience in a haunted house what it should be thus at last we come to two of the stories that attempt to give a scientific explanation another phase of the modern style of ghost story one of these perhaps hardly modern as far as mere years are concerned is this same story of bulwer the haunted and the haunters besides being a rattling good old-fashioned terror of horror it attempts a new-fashioned scientific explanation it is enough to read and re-read it it is however the lamented ambrose pierce who has gone furthest in the science and the philosophy of the matter and in a very short story too splendidly titled the damned thing incredible exclaims the coroner at the inquest that is nothing to you sir replies the newspaper man who relates the experience and in these words expresses the true feelings about ghostly fiction that is nothing to you if i also swear that it is true but furthest of all in his scientific explanation not scientifically explaining away but in explaining the way goes pierce as he outlines a theory from the diary of the murdered man he picks out the following which we may treasure as a gem i am not mad 
there are colors that we cannot see and god help me the damned thing is of such a color this fascination of the ghost story have i made it clear as i write nearing midnight the bookcase behind me cracks i start and turn nothing there is a creak of a board in the hallway i know it is the cool night wind the uneven contraction of materials expanded in the heat of the day yet do i go into the darkness outside otherwise than alert it is this evolution of our sense of ghost terror ages of it that fascinates us can we with a few generations of modernism behind us throw it off with all our science and if we did shall we not then succeed only in abolishing the old-fashioned ghost story in creating a new scientific ghost story scientific yes but more something that has existed since the beginnings of intelligence in the human race perhaps you critic you say that the true ghost story originated in the age of shadowy candlelight and pine knot with her grotesqueries on the walls and in the unpenetrated darkness that the electric bulb and the radiator have dispelled that very thing on which for ages the ghost story has been built what no ghost stories would you take away our supernatural fiction by your paltry scientific explanation still will we gather about the storyteller then lie awake o nights seeing mocking figures arms akimbo defying all your science to crush the ghost story end of the fascination of the ghost story the ghost of the dane by edward capern coffee break collection twenty four ghosts ghouls and spooky things this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the ghost of the dane twelve tolled the bell in the old grey tower the prayer was o'er for the dead the lights were out in the abbey hall and the abbot lay in his bed the north wind blew on the broken coast the waves leaped under the sky god keep the ship from the wild lee shore was many a landsman's cry out from the dark came the broad full moon with the glare of a phantom light into the dark she shot full soon making a dreary night came down the hill from abbotsham each walking timorously three travellers at that gloomy hour but not in company about a league from abbotsham a half league from the sea two furlongs space from the northern ham as near as it may be a path there was across the down a beaten saxon road hard by a stone rude shapen was of monstrous weight and broad out from the night came the broad full moon out from the dark came she while a spectral form without a shroud spake out imploringly ho 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 who goeth there help to relay this stone they have roused me from my slumbers here spake he of the grisly bone whence comest thou my good yeoman and whither in haste away from my low thatched cot near the abbot's ham to the village beside the bay spake the gaunt spectre of grisly bone come tarry a while i pray but the yeoman fled with his bristling hair to the village beside the bay ho 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 my sailor bold help me this stone to lay i cannot tarry the night is cold and my ship is under way spake the grim spectre of grisly bone the yeoman went his way and thou shalt lack courage in days to come when thy ship is out of the bay no grace to thy soul when thou comest to die what to the ghost quoth he 
no grace to thy soul when thou comest to die for thou showest no pity to me ho ho there thou in the huge grey hood whence dost thou come this way my good man lives in the northern ham speak on what hast to say spake the gaunt spectre of grisly bone under the dark night sky some vassal hand hath shifted this stone which over my bones did lie take courage for all of womankind shall pass in comfort here but the yeoman stout and sailor bold shall shake for very fear i pledge thee my troth when the cock hath crowed and called thee down to rest i will pray for the peace of thy troubled soul and replace the stone on thy breast god rest thee good woman stay a while and trust me faithfully and i will tell thee how i came a ghostly form to be in olden days the gallant danes came sailing o'er the sea and many a battle saw they fought in this thy fair country o oh, brave right brave were the northern men and wild as wolf on the wold and brave right brave was the stout saxon and his king was wise and bold far far away in selwood's shade did valley and alfred hide who lived on the faith of a better time when we sailed o'er the tide oh wild was the sea on that wild day when we our troops did land at appledore port inside the bay and hubba held command hard was the fight we waged with the foe as we stood in the blood-stained wave but the saxon band in the strife gave way when spake our hubba brave there is a chief in kenwith hall brave odin is his name the valiant earl of devonshire of good and worthy fame up yonder is the beaten road on to the castle now odin before bold hubba's sword his haughty head shall bow comes up a host from the town by the sea spake the warder upon the wall and the blast he blew from his trusty horn was heard in kenwith hall the earl was there with his merry men all ready stout and true let the brown ale rest in its flagon now there is ruder work to do the danes were below the castle wall when hubba spake to his band this tower so strong my true men all no northman shall withstand spake odin the earl of devonshire thy northmen may be true but before brave odin yields his sword they have much rough work to do swift shot a shower of deadly darts from their stubborn bows of yew and as fast and faster they pierced their hearts faster the arrows flew many a day and many a night the northmen dared to stay till the moat with the fierce dane's blood was red as red as the dying day now for the charge my saxons true and oh twas a savage fray but the northmen by the saxon band were driven into the bay on bloody corners trampled sward i fell among the slain as onward rolled the battle wave and swept away the dane and yonder grave by the winding shore with seaweed overgrown on the eastward side of appledore is our great hubba's stone over the clouds sailed the broad full moon like a ship on a troubled sea i am summoned down to the shades below spake the ghost and vanished he end of the ghost of the dane Halloween Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghost Ghouls and Spooky Things This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Halloween 
pixie kobold elf and sprite all are on their rounds to-night in the wan moon's silver ray thrives their helter-skelter play fond of cellar barn or stack true unto the almanac they present to credulous eyes strange hobgoblin mysteries cabbage stumps straws wet with dew apple skins and chestnuts too and a mirror for some lass show what wonders come to pass doors they move and gates they hide mischiefs that on moonbeams ride are their deeds and by their spells love records its oracles don't we all of long ago by the ruddy fireplace glow in the kitchen and the hall those queer coof like pranks recall eerie shadows were they then but to-night they come again were we once once more but sixteen precious would be halloween joel benton in harper's weekly october thirty first eighteen ninety six end of recording halloween by j k bangs read by tony scheinman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Halloween Bring forth the raisins and the nuts. Tonight all hallows spectre struts along the moonlit way. No time is this for tear or sob, or other woes or joys to rob, but time for Pippin and for Bob and Jack-o'-lantern gay. Come forth, ye lass and trousered kid, from prisoned mischief raise the lid and lift it good and high. Leave grave old wisdom in the lurch, set folly on a lofty perch, nor fear the awesome rod of birch when dawn illumes the sky. Tis night for revel, set apart to re-illume the darkened heart and rout the hosts of dole. Tis night when goblin, elf, and fay come dancing in their best array to prank and royster on the way and ease the troubled soul. The ghosts of all things past parade emerging from the mist and shade that hid them from our gaze, and full of song and ringing mirth, in one glad moment of rebirth, again they walk the ways of earth as in the ancient days. The beacon light shines on the hill, the will-o'-wisps the forests fill with flashes filched from noon, and witches on their broomsticks spry speed here and yonder in the sky and lift their strident voices high unto the hunter's moon. The air resounds with tuneful notes from myriads of straining throats, all hailing folly queen. So join the swelling choral throng, forget your sorrows and your wrong, in one glad hour of joyous song to honor Halloween. End of Halloween Halloween by A. F. Murray Read by Tony Scheinman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Halloween a gypsy flame is on the hearth, sign of this carnival of mirth. Through the dun fields and from the glade flash merry folk in masquerade. It is the witching Halloween. Pale tapers glimmer in the sky, the dead and dying leaves go by. Dimly across the faded green, strange shadows, stranger shades are seen. It is the mystic Halloween. Soft gusts of love and memory beat at the heart reproachfully. The lights that burned for those who die were flickering low. Let them flare high. It is the haunting Halloween. End of Halloween Halloween, Old and New Time, edited by J. Walker McFadden, 1874-1960. to Coffee Break Collection 24, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Spooky Things.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Halloween, Old Time and New Time. Old Time. Hark! Did you hear that sound in the grass? Mayhap a witch or ghost did pass. Was that the owl's lone cry? Is that the wind among the trees? What voices whispering in the breeze? Are spirits really nigh? No time. Hark! Did you hear that sound in the grass? Perhaps some mischief makers pass there's laughter in their cry this is the night for girls and boys for games and pranks and stunts and noise with lanterns gleaming high end of halloween old time new time published in nineteen seventeen halloween by winifred m letts coffee break collection twenty four ghosts ghouls and spooky things this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anita sloma martinez halloween the girls are laughing with the boys and gaming by the fire they're wishful every one of them to see her heart's desire twas thessy cut the barn brack and found the ring inside before next hallows e'en has dawned herself will be a bride but little molly stands alone outside the cabin door and breaks her heart for one the waves threw dead upon the shore twas katie's nut leapt from the hearth and left poor pat's alone but ellen's stayed by christie burns upon the wide hearthstone and all the while the childer bobbed for apples set afloat the old men smoked their pipes and talked about the foundered boat but molly walked upon the cliff and never feared the rain she called the name of one she loved and bid him come again young peter pulled the cabbage stump to win a wealthy wife rosanna threw the apple peel to know who'd share her life and lizzie had a looking-glass she'd hid in some dark place to try if there for hence to her own she'd see her comrade's face but molly walked along the quay where terry's feet had trod and sobbed her grief out in the night with no one near but god she heard the laughter from the house she heard the fiddle played she called her dead love to her side why should she be afraid she took his cold hands in her own she had no thought of dread and not a star looked out to watch the living kiss the dead the lads are gaming with the girls and laughing by the fire but molly in the cold dark night has found her heart's desire end of hallows e'en the swinging apples by alice hall burnett coffee brat collection twenty four ghosts girls and spooky things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Liverpool. The Swinging Apples. Mother Brown now whispered something in Fat's ear, and with a broad grin, Fat disappeared through the door leading to the kitchen. In another moment, he reappeared, carrying two large well-greased pans in his hands at once the boys all crowded about the fireplace trying to help and in less time than it takes to tell the taffy that had been boiling in the large pot was poured into the pans and set away to cool by jiminy i hope it tastes as good as it smells observed toad i'm sure it will replied mother brown with a smile stand in line ordered chuck while i tie your hands behind your backs you're not going to spank us are you wailed fat making believe to cry no silly laughed chuck adding everyone take off his slip now we need our whole faces to play this game 
toad with the help of father brown then placed a long pole so that the ends rested on the top of two bookcases and from it hung many bright red apples tied on with strings now said chuck the fellow who can take one good bite out of an apple without using anything to steady it with gets a prize me first cried herbie all right was the reply go ahead and herbie started at first it seemed very easy but whenever he got ready to take a good bite the apple always slipped away the boys all laughed as herbie made one dive after another ah have a bite cried reddy i picked that one out for you herbie then gave the apple a push and stood with his mouth wide open awaiting the return swing but instead of getting a bite the apple landed on his nose fat fairly rolled over with laughter and after a few more attempts herbie gave up his place to lynn smith then father brown took herbie's apple off the string and tossing it to him said here's the bibby prize lynn had no better luck than herbie although he tried his hardest the apple always bobbed about his head rolling away just as he thought he had it you're next cried out toad as fat stepped forward toward the apples good evening said fat bowing low i've a very empty feeling would you like to step inside ah hurry up shouted reddy i want a turn some time tonight so do i chimed in hoppy smith fat grinned don't be in such a hurry it never pays he retorted again and again he tried but did no better than the rest hoppy smith who followed had no success and then came reddy's turn bending down he brought his face up under the lower end of the apple and opening his mouth very wide and bringing his teeth together with a quick snap he succeeded in biting a piece out of the apple dandy shouted toad he gets the prize and as he handed the winner a box reddy opened it and exclaimed oh that's a knife that's great and i needed one too that's a beauty declared herbie you're lucky red End of The Swinging Apples The Terror by Guy de Maupassant Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghosts, Ghouls and Spooky Things This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Terror you say you cannot possibly understand it and i believe you you think i am losing my mind perhaps i am but for other reasons than those you imagine my dear friend yes i am going to be married and will tell you what has led me to take that step i may add that i know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow i have only seen her four or five times I know that there is nothing unpleasing about her, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout, so, of course, the day after tomorrow I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich, and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl such as you may find by the gross, well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her, Mademoiselle Joel is a very nice girl, and tomorrow they will say, What a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls whom one is glad to have for one's wife, till the moment comes when one discovers that one happens to prefer all other women to that particular woman whom one has buried. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reasons that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am afraid of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity me and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. 
I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side so that I may be able to ask some sudden question, a stupid question even, if I feel inclined so that I may hear a human voice and feel that there is some waking soul close to me, someone whose reason is at work so that when I hastily light a candle I may see some human face by my side because, because I am ashamed to confess it, because I am afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me yet. I am not afraid of any danger. If a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, well, it must be told. I am afraid of myself afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh, if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects, which are animated, as far as I am concerned, by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason, which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look around, and of course nothing is to be seen, and I wish that there were something there, no matter what, as long as it were something tangible. I am frightened merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what, behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard, or under my bed, and yet all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, and I turn around suddenly because I am afraid of what is behind me, although there is nothing there, and I know it. I become agitated, I feel that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed, and hide under the clothes, and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair, and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is alight on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet I dare not do it. It is very terrible, it is not to be like that. Formerly I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite calm and went up and down my apartment without anything disturbing my peace of mind. Had one told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of most improbable fear, such a stupid and terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I went to bed slowly without locking it and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year in a very strange manner on a damp autumn evening. When my servant had left the room, after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and even without energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy, a prey to one of those fits of despondency, without any apparent cause which make us feel inclined to cry, or to talk, no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. I felt that I was alone, and my rooms seemed to me to be more empty than they had ever been before. I was in the midst of infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but a kind of nervous impatience seemed to affect my legs, so I got up and began to walk about again. I was, perhaps, rather feverish, for my hands, which I had clasped behind me, as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then suddenly a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my rooms, so I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon I felt that I could not possibly remain quiet, and so I got up again and determined to go out to pull myself together and to find a friend to bear me company. I could not find anyone, so I walked to the boulevard to try and meet some acquaintance or other there. It was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight, while the oppressive warmth of the almost impalpable rain lay heavily over the streets and seemed to obscure the light of the lamps. I went on slowly, saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. 
I glance into several cafes from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonnerie and saw many unhappy looking individuals sitting at the tables who did not seem even to have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time I wandered aimlessly up and down and about midnight I started for home. I was very calm and very tired. My janitor opened the door at once, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had probably just come in. When I go out, I always double locked the door of my room, and I found it merely closed, which surprised me, but I supposed that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in and found my fire still burning so that it lighted up the room a little and while in the act of taking up a candle, I noticed somebody sitting in my armchair by the fire, warming his feet with his back towards me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought, very naturally, that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, to whom I had said I was going out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head and he had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite distinctly. His right arm was hanging down and his legs were crossed. The position of his head, which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be? I asked myself. I could not see clearly, as the room was rather dark, so I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and he came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there. The seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment I drew back as if confronted by some terrible danger, then I turned round again, impelled by an imperious standing upright, panting with fear, so upset that I could not collect my thoughts and ready to faint. But I am a cold man, and soon recovered myself. I thought, it is a mere hallucination, that is all and I immediately began to reflect on this phenomenon. Thoughts fly quickly at such moments. I had been suffering from an hallucination that was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid and had acted regularly and logically, so there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision, one of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous seizure of the optical apparatus, nothing more. The eyes were rather congested, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire, in doing so I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself up with a jump, as if somebody had touched me from behind. I was certainly not by any means calm. I walked up and down a little, and hummed a tune or two, then I double-locked the door and felt rather reassured. Now, at any rate, nobody could come in. I sat down again and thought over my adventure for a long time. Then I went to bed and blew out my light. For some minutes all went well. I lay quietly on my back, but presently an irresistible desire seized me to look around the room, and I turned over on my side. My fire was nearly out, and a few glowing embers threw a faint light on the floor by the chair, where I fancied I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken. There was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed, and tried to go to sleep, as the room was now dark but I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes when in my dream I saw all the scene which I had previously witnessed as clearly as if it were reality. I woke up with a start, and having lit the candle, sat up in bed without venturing even to try to go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me for a few moments in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought that I was cured, and slept peacefully till noon. It was all past and over, I had been feverish, had had the nightmare, I know not what, I had been ill, in fact, but yet thought I was a great fool. 
I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I dined at a restaurant and afterward went to the theater, and then started for home. But as I got near the house, I was once more seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid lest fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour I wandered up and down the pavement. Then, feeling that I was really too foolish, I returned home. I breathed so hard that I could hardly get upstairs and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes. Then suddenly I had a courageous impulse and my will asserted itself. I inserted my key into the lock and went into the apartment with a candle in my hand. I kicked open my bedroom door, which was partly open, and cast a frightened glance towards the fireplace. There was nothing there. Ah, what a relief and what a delight, what a deliverance. I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured and kept turning round with a jump. The very shadows in the corners disquieted me. I slept badly and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time, I had been afraid of being alone at night. I feel that the specter is there close to me, around me, but it has not appeared to me again. And supposing it did, what will it matter since I do not believe in it and know that it is nothing? Still, it's, however, it still worries me, because I am constantly thinking of it, his right arm hanging down and his head inclined to the left like a man who was asleep. I don't, I don't want to think about it. Why, however, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid, but who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears and in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes, it is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen my backbone, so to say, but I cannot remain at home because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again. He will not show himself again. That is all over, but he is there, all the same, in my thoughts. He remains invisible, but that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the closed cupboard in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door or the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light on the dark places, he is there no longer, but I feel that he is behind me. I turn round, certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again, but for all that, he is behind me. It is very stupid, it is dreadful, but what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place, I feel certain that he would not be there any longer, for he is there just because I am alone, simply and solely because I am alone. End of the Terror The Witch Tells Fortunes by Alice Hall Burnett Coffee Break Collection 24 Ghosts, Ghouls and Spooky Things this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Witch Tells Fortunes. Come in, invite a father and the boys, standing in a grip, watching the knob of the door turn slowly. As it opened silently, they saw standing on the threshold a little old woman all bent over, a long black cape and hood covering her from head to foot. She carried a cane with a crook in it, and leaned very heavily upon it as she walked. Muttering to herself, she crossed the room and took a seat by the fire. Her hoarse grey hair fell in strangly locks about her face, almost hiding it from view. Suddenly the lights went out, leaving the room in darkness, save for the firelight. Place the pot before me, she ordered in a high, broken voice, shaking her stick at fat yes ma'am said fat hurrying to obey she's got fat scared to death giggled toad to reddy from under her cape she now took a small paper bag and poured the contents into the pot before her then standing up she hobbled around it three times 
waving her arms and humming a queer little tune soon a dull red light glowed from within the pot getting brighter and brighter it's magic whispered toad to hopey smith the old witch now sat down again and took from beneath her cape a small pad a long quill pen and a queer little bottle filled with milky white fluid if you drink any of that you'll get as small as a flea said fat in a low voice the old witch rapped hard on the floor with her cane herbie come forward she commanded go ahead giggled reddy giving him a little push and herbie stepped before the witch she did not notice him at first being very busy writing upon a slip of paper with the quill pen which she dipped into a little bottle presently she raised her head and handed him the paper bend low thine ear she said and herbie obeyed keep this till i am gone she added then hold it over yonder candle light for thy fortune is written there each boy was now called in turn to receive a slip of paper then the old witch arose to those who obey my commands good luck to those who disobey ill fortune she cried shaking her stick in the air and in another moment she had quickly hobbled from the room chuck now turned on the lights and lynn exclaimed where on earth did she ever come from why witches come out of the air explained toad they travel on a broomstick let's see what she wrote on the papers proposed hopey smith yes agreed reddy she told me to hold it over the candlelight at which chuck came forward with a candle that he placed on the centre table holding his slip of paper before the flame the other boys eagerly gathered about to watch soon the paper got hot and letters began to appear look there's an a and two e's and and cried chuck it's quite plain now i can read it go on shout it ready let's hear it chuck began if your head will rule your heart from a scent you'll never part so tell your heart to rule your head and all will mourn you when you're dead that means if you're stingy no one will care when you're gone explained lynn at which chuck laughed with the others herbie now held his over the light and as the letters appeared he read don't always be in too great haste it often means a dreadful waste await your turn and take with ease the piece you want with fingers greased that's you and the molasses candy laughed reddy adding here's mine your hair may be of brilliant hue but this should never bother you for when the winter winds blow most your head will be as warm as toast that's great cried reddy as all the boys laughed fat now held his slip over the flame and as the words appeared read slowly if you should eat a pound of lemons every other day you'll grow as lean as any pole for so i've heard folks say but if upon the other hand you keep on eating pie you'll grow so big and round and tall you'll almost reach the sky you'd bear be careful fat and buy a barrel of lemons suggested toad i'll order a wagon load grinned fat hope he now held his paper near the candle and in a moment read if you're the lad to find the coin that's hidden in the flower you the highest will enjoy of health and wealth and power toad's turn now came and upon his paper was written you're very fond of teasing all the girls and pulling off the ribbons from their curls but mark my words these tricks you'll surely rue for when you're grown a few they'll play on you that's a good one for you to remember toad laughed the others lynn now read your mouth may be large as i've often heard you say but your words show a brain that is working you'll go to the top of the ladder because you do what you do without shirking the old witch must have liked you lynn commented reddy that's the best yet end of the witch tells fortunes a haunted house in georgia from true ghost stories by hereward carrington coffee break collection twenty four ghosts ghouls and spooky things this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Kotzer. A Haunted House in Georgia. 
the following account is taken from the report of the san francisco examiner and is certainly one of the most striking cases of the character on record it is not put forward as strictly evidential but its interesting nature certainly warrants its insertion in this volume soon after the walsinghams took up their abode in their new home they began to be disturbed by strange sounds and odd phenomena these disturbances generally took the form of noises in the house after the family had retired and the lights had been extinguished continual banging of the doors things overturned the doorbell rang and the annoying of the house dog a large and intelligent mastiff one day don caesar the mastiff was found in the hallway barking furiously and bristling with rage while his eyes seemed directed to the wall just before him at last he made a spring forward with a hoarse yelp of ungovernable fury only to fall back as if flung down by some powerful and cruel hand upon examination it was found that his neck had been broken the house cat on the contrary seemed rather to enjoy the favor of the ghost and would often enter a door as if escorting some visitor whose hand was stroking her back she would also climb about a chair rubbing herself and purring as if well pleased at the presence of someone in the seat she and don caesar invariably manifested this eccentric conduct at the same time as though the mysterious being were visible to both of them the annoying visitant finally took to arousing the family at all hours of the night by making such a row as to render any rest impossible this noise which consisted of shouts groans hideous laughter and a peculiar most distressing wail would sometimes proceed apparently from under the house sometimes from the ceiling and at other times in the very room in which the family was seated one night miss amelia walsingham the young lady daughter was engaged at her toilet when she felt a hand softly laid on her shoulder thinking it her mother or sister she glanced at the glass before her only to be thunderstruck at seeing the mirror reflect no form but her own though she could plainly see a man's broad hand lying on her arm she brought the family to her by her screams but when they reached her all sign of the mysterious hand had gone mr walsingham himself saw footsteps form beside his own while walking through the garden after a light rain the marks were those of a man's naked feet and fell beside his own as if the person walked at his side matters grew so serious that the walsinghams became frightened and talked of leaving the house when an event took place which confirmed them in this determination the family was seated at the supper table with several guests who were spending the evening when a loud groan was heard in the room overhead this was however nothing unusual and very little notice was taken of it until one of the visitors pointed out a stain of what looked like blood on the white tablecloth and it was seen that some liquid was slowly dripping on the table from the ceiling overhead this liquid was so much like freshly shed blood that it horrified those who watched it slow dropping mr walsingham with several of his guests ran hastily upstairs and into the room directly over the one in which the blood was dripping a carpet covered the floor and nothing appeared to explain the source of the ghastly rain but anxious to satisfy themselves thoroughly the carpet was immediately ripped up and the boarding found to be perfectly dry and even covered with a thin layer of dust and all the while the floor was being examined the persons below could swear the blood never ceased to drop a stain the size of a dinner plate was formed before the drops ceased to fall this stain was examined the next day under the microscope and was pronounced by competent chemists to be human blood 
the walsinghams left the house next day and since then the place has been apparently given over to spooks and evil spirits which make the night hideous with the noise of revel shouts and furious yells hundreds from all over this county and adjacent ones have visited the place but few have had the courage to pass the night in the haunted house one daring spirit however horace gunn of savannah accepted a wager that he could not spend twenty-four hours in it and did so though he declares that there is not enough money in the country to make him pass another night there he was found the morning after by his friends with whom he made the wager in a swoon he has never recovered from the shock of his horrible experience and is still confined to his bed suffering from nervous prostration his story is that shortly after nightfall he endeavored to kindle a fire in one of the rooms and to light the lamp with which he had provided himself but to his surprise and consternation found it impossible to do either an icy breath which seemed to proceed from some invisible person at his side extinguished each match as he lighted it at this peculiarly terrifying turn of affairs mr gunn would have left the house and forfeited the amount of his wager a considerable one but he was restrained by the fear of ridicule he steadied himself in the dark with what calmness he could and waited developments for some time nothing occurred and the young man was half dozing when after an hour or two he was brought to his feet by a sudden yell of pain or rage that seemed to come from under the house this appeared to be the signal for an outbreak of hideous noises all over the house the sound of running feet could be heard scurrying up and down the stairs hastening from one room to another as if one person fled from the pursuit of a second this kept up for nearly an hour but at last ceased altogether and for some time mr gunn sat in darkness and quiet and had about concluded that the performance was over for the night at last however his attention was attracted by a white spot that gradually appeared on the opposite wall the spot continued to brighten until it seemed a disk of white fire when the horrified spectator saw that the light emanated from and surrounded a human head which without a body or any visible means of support was moving slowly along the wall about the height of a man from the floor this ghastly head appeared to be that of an aged person though whether male or female it was difficult to determine the hair was long and gray and matted together with dark clots of blood which also issued from a deep jagged wound in one temple the cheeks were fallen in and the whole face indicated suffering and unspeakable misery the eyes were wide open and gleamed with an unearthly fire while the glassy eyes seemed to follow the terror-stricken gun who was too thoroughly paralyzed by what he saw to move or cry out finally the head disappeared and the room was once more left in darkness but the young man could hear what seemed to be half a dozen persons moving about him while the whole house shook as if rocked by some violent earthquake the groaning and the wailing that broke forth from every direction was something terrific and an unearthly rattle and banging as of china or tin pans being flung to the ground floor from the upper story added to the deafening noise gunn at last roused himself sufficiently to try and leave the haunted house feeling his way along the wall in order to avoid the beings whatever they were that filled the room the young man had nearly succeeded in reaching the door when he found himself seized by the ankle and was violently thrown to the floor he was grasped by icy hands which sought to grip him about the throat he struggled with his unseen foe but was soon overpowered and choked into insensibility when found by his friends his throat was black with the marks of long thin fingers armed with cruel curved nails 
the only explanation which can be found for these mysterious manifestations is that about three months before a number of bones were discovered on the walsingham place which some declared even then to be those of a human being mr walsingham pronounced them however to be an animal's and they were hastily thrown into an adjacent lime kiln it is supposed to be the outraged spirit of a person to whom they belonged in life which is now creating such consternation end of a haunted house in georgia recording by andrea kotzer